Well, welcome to this video about Spring Offensive. Now, Spring Offensive is a little bit different to some of the other poems that we've studied, um, simply because of its size. It runs for several paragraphs, but it is similar to Anthem in some ways, in that it's it's a poem about a universal experience of soldiers in World War One. That idea of going over the top. Right? He calls it Spring Offensive because. Often the big battles did begin in spring when the weather warmed up and the earth dried out a little bit. There wasn't so much mud. But this idea that you had, you were ordered to jump up out of your trench or over a hill and then just charge at the enemy. Um, he tries to capture that in a really universal way. So it doesn't matter which side the soldier's on. The experience that he describes is... Pretty universal. All right, so let's get started. This um, opening stanza halted against the shade of a last hill. They fed and lying easy were at ease and finding comfortable chests and knees carelessly slept. But many there stood still to face the stark blank sky beyond the ridge, knowing their feet had come to the end of the world. All right, so we we're just he's describing a battalion or a group of soldiers who've been ordered up to the front. They're still not um, about to go into battle. They're pretty much at ease. They're just at rest behind the main lines. Um, and they're quite comfortable and careless, um, sleeping and probably, probably drinking and smoking and, you know, what soldiers do when they're not on duty. But he talks about this trepidation. Um, some of them were aware of it. And and this idea of coming to the end of the world, um, this metaphor that the front or the, where the trenches or the, the, the battle was being held was literally like another world. And he, he follows this idea through you know, this otherworldly notion of humans entering something that is not of our nature and not of our natural world. Um, so it's quite a powerful image that he works with there. All right, so everything's pretty much at peace. He continues on. Marvelling they stood and watched the long grass swirled by the May breeze, murmurous with wasp and midge. For though the summer oozed in their veins, like the injected drug for their bones pains, Sharp on their souls hung the imminent line of grass. Fearfully flashed the sky's mysterious glass. All right, so this talks about how the soldiers are watching the, in the direction of the battle. Um, and although it is a beautiful spring day in May, um, in the, it's a year, it's a French summer, and so the the, the warmth of the sun is is oozing into their into their skin and they're feeling warm and comfortable um, you know and he says it's like an injected drug it's the power of nature to enter their bodies and make them feel good um, but sharp on their souls hung the imminent line of grass so this line that you cross from grass into dirt and mud and this otherworldly type of idea where everything's burnt or destroyed, or been poisoned. Um, and this sky's mysterious flash of glass. Now this, I suppose, is the, the white flashes that are going on at the front. Um, you know, those flashes of explosives, perhaps, that are filling the sky. There's no noise here. He doesn't talk about the sound of it. He certainly talks about the flashing of the light in the sky. All right, so... He still continues on with this idea um, of, you know, they're, they're not quite at the front yet, they're just at ease, but there's a sense of impending doom. Hour after hour they ponder the warm field and the far valley beyond where the buttercups, buttercups had blessed with gold their slow boots coming up, for well, even the little brambles would not yield, but clutched and clung to them like sorrowing hands. They breathed like trees unstirred. So again, you've got this idea of nature, right? So as they have been walking up to the front, um, 
the little buttercups and flowers that they've been stepping through because they have just been brushing their boots as they've gone past. And, and there's a personification of nature here where the buttercups have actually been blessing them. And the little brambles have been holding onto them. As you know, brambles do when you walk through sort of um, sort of low bush. But this personification of the brambles is the brambles have been clinging onto them, hoping they could stop them going up towards the front, right? like sorrowing hands. So this is quite heavy in personification and in simile. Um, and particularly this last line here, they breathe like trees unstirred. You know, this idea that um, they're alive, but they're like trees. There's no emotion to them. You know, they, they are ignoring their natural emotional urges, which probably tell them that they should run away as fast as they can. They're doing their duty, um, and they're unstirred by the fear and the trepidation that comes with um, moving up to the front for the big spring offensive. So they're very much like trees in that, they, yes, they're alive, but they're not giving anything away, and they're not giving in to any emotional... Um, I suppose any decision making that would go against what they've been told to do. All right, and then Owen changes the mood a bit, and he, he does it by this word "cold," by this word "cold" or this phrase "cold gust." Till like a cold gust thrilled the little world, word at which each body and its soul be gird and tightened them for battle. So the times come, and the moods changed, and the temperatures change. It's like a cold wind. Now, this is not a glorious battle. This is not a romantic notion of war here. This is a World War I style of war. So there is no alarms, no bugles, no high flags or clamorous haste. Right? It's not like a, an old style battle where you got on your horse and you charged across the field and it was all very glorious. This is all about surprise, not letting the enemy know you're coming. Only a lift and a flare of eyes that faced the sun, like a friend with whom their love is done. Now, this is symbolic of the fact that they are leaving the natural world. They're rejecting nature and they're heading into another world because of this idea of that they've come to the end of the world. Right? So the sun, who's been their friend up until now, is rejected by these guys. A larger shone that smile against the sun, mightier than whose bounty these have spurned. All right, so the war and their duty and what they've had to, um, what they have to do, is stronger than this relationship they have with the sun, which is symbolic of this relationship they have with the natural world. You know, the buttercups and the brambles, the sun, the warmth. Um, these men have had to spurn all that because of their duty. And they've gone up into this you know, other world to do their duty, spurning the previous world that they've had they've been able to live in. All right. And then suddenly we have some action, right? Not that they haven't been doing anything, but they haven't been doing very much. They've been lying around and thinking about things. But now they're in it. So so soon they topped the hill and raced together over an open stretch of herb and heather, exposed. So suddenly World War One was always a be was always about digging a hole and getting protection underground. Um, the idea that once you're out in the open, that you're exposed to this um, enormous storm of lead and steel that just fills the air and, and um, <clears throat> kills so many. So these guys have topped the hill and they're exposed. In other words, they're all in danger. And instantly the whole sky burned with fury against them. So skies don't burn. So this is again this idea of a natural, unnatural world where the sky is actually full of fire. It's alive with fire. And soft Sudden cups are opened in thousands for their blood. Now, this is a um, description of shrapnel fire from shells that would all the bits of shrapnel would hit the ground and create like little divots everywhere. But he uses this idea 
to suggest that their their blood is going to fill up these little holes. And and just like Jesus sacrificed himself and and gave us his body and blood, these guys are going to sacrifice themselves as well. And their blood will pour into these little cups in the ground and be sim symbolic of their sacrifice. And the green slopes chasmed and st steepened sheer to infinite space. Again, this other world. Suddenly they've fallen off the end of the world and they're into an infinite space. Somewhere beyond the reaches of our world. Now this stanza here is quite powerful because it talks about the way these guys die. Of them who running on that last high place leapt to swift unseen bullets. All right, so some were shot with bullets or went up on the hot blast and fury of hell's upsurge. All right, hell's upsurge. So in other words, they were hit by shellfire um, and just blown up. Or plunged and fell away past this world's verge. Some say God caught them even before they fell. So again, this idea of falling off the end of the world. Um, but he uses um, the very real battlefield um, problem of guys being buried. Right? So literally the, the earth underneath them would be ruptured through high explosive shells and then the enormous tons and tons and tons of dirt would fly up into the air and then fall on people and they would be buried. And some of them would be buried alive. So these guys could either be buried alive or they could be blown up or they could be shot. Right? Either way, it's another world. It's, it's like falling off the end of the world. It's not a natural place for humans to be. Right? And that's what Owen is trying to work with. Uh, I was trying to uh, suggest with his, um, with his comparison. All right, last stanza. We're getting there. But what say such as from existence spring ventured but tro drove too swift to sink? So in other words, not everybody dies. Some guys get through and they end up fighting the enemy. So they get through this hellfire of um, steel and, and explosion only to get to the opposite trench where they have to fight for their survival. The few who rushed in the body to enter hell and there, outfiending all its fiends and flames with superhuman inhumanities. These guys who survived the initial run have to jump into enemy trenches and fight like hell. Fight in a way that is evil, devilish, demonic even. Right? They are outfiending all the fiends. So they've gone to hell and they're outfiending all the demons that are there. With superhuman inhumanities. In other words, they've had to do incredible things to survive. Um, and they've probably killed a lot of people to, just to survive. And that creates a bit of a dichotomy because a lot of people would regard this as glorious. You know, that you've attacked, you survived, and you've defeated the enemy in battle, um, and that's a glorious thing. But it's also f an immemorial shame because it's not something you want to remember. You don't want to remember killing lots of people. It's very much a paradox, isn't it? Long famous glories and immemorial shames. And crawling slowly back have by degrees regained cool, peaceful air in wonder. So what is their wonder? They're wondering how it was that they were able to act that way. They're probably wondering also how they managed to, to escape and survive. But more so, it's this idea that they've, they've rejected their human side and turned into demons and devils um, and done terrible, terrible things. Why? Because they did it to survive. And the effect of it is, this rhetorical question to finish. Why speak they not of comrades that went under? Well, they don't speak of these guys because they can't. To do so brings up too much pain, too many demonic memories, um, and not being able to speak to anyone about it who could possibly understand what it was like. 
um, to go into a battle like that and, and do horrific things just to stay alive. So what Owen's done here is he's created a poem of the experience of going over the top and, and going into battle. Um, and Owen has credibility because he did it. And so when he talks about it in this way, we certainly do sit up and take notice that he is capturing the enormous difficulty, the, the unnatural act of actually getting out of a trench and running into, into hell. Right? Most of us, the fear in our bodies would drive us to run the other way. But these, these guys ignored every warning in their brains that said, don't do that, don't do that. And this is the incredible bravery of these guys, that they would ignore their minds, they would do their duty, they would get, they would cro jump over the top of the, um, of the hill or jump out of the trench, charge into um, an experience that could only ever be described as hellish and otherworldly. It's not something that the natural world would ever um, would ever um, prepare you for, um, and Owen sort of leaves it like that. He just sort of says, "Well, this is the horror of it, and and, and even if you survive it, you know the damage runs very deep." Right? So another really powerful poem by Owen about the the soldier experience. Uh, and one that will work quite well with the assessment task as well, which is not so much about death, but about the damage that war can do um, to a soldier and to the soldier's um, being, rather than just the notion that a lot of people die. All right. Uh, I hope that was helpful. Thank you.